Good evening, folks. Can everybody hear me? Before we start the, uh, the q and A, I'd just like to ask everybody um, if they could stand. I'd like to do the Pledge of Allegiance and do a, a moment of silence. So, I forgot you guys were hooked up, so sorry about that. That's all right. Okay. So I'll start. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I would also like to ask you, as today is 9-11, to do a moment of silence, and I would also like to ask you um, for a, a moment of silence blended in for a World War II veteran who was my father, David Lindy, who passed away today at uh, just before noon. So. Thank you, everybody. So we are here in Ward 6 at the Ashfield School, and uh, we're doing something a little different. We have here three candidates for Ward 6 City Councilor, and I'll introduce them in ballot order. First, we have uh, John Drazinskis, who's right here. Second, we have Joanne Zygmunt, who's right in the middle. And we have the current Ward 6 Councilor, Jack Lally, who is on the right. Thank you for agreeing to do this. I think this is a wonderful thing that candidates so far, Ward 6, uh, we've, we've done a few uh, candidates forums and everybody's uh, still smiling and everybody's still talking to each other. So that's always a good thing in politics. So I'm gonna draw, there are two baskets. The first basket has questions from residents that are here in Ward 6, and the second basket has a couple of questions from the folks that don't live in Ward 6. But a city councilor from Ward 6, or any city councilor, deals with citywide issues, as do the four councilors at large, so we felt that those were appropriate. The only thing in the rules that if there is a um, question that either attacks a candidate or seems to be biased, I'm gonna sift it out and filter it a little bit. Being from public access, I don't filter democracy. So the, the first question, and uh, the question is for all three of the candidates. Um, what about improvements to other parks in Ward 4? Examples of Tukas Park and Hillstrom Park. So I'll pass the mic down and we'll switch the order around as, as we go. So we'll start with, with John. Okay, first of all, um, we're in Ward 6. That's not Ward 4, okay? Um, <laughs> just a little correction. Um, so, uh, Tukas, uh, the last time Tukas Playground has been uh, renovated was probably, oh, about 20 years ago. Um, it was a mess, and the city did a nice job do doing it over. Um, there's been neighborhood association associations that have been trying to keep up with uh, eliminating things like graffiti and the trash on the ground and so forth. Uh, Hillstrom Park, uh, the problem I have with Hillstrom Park is that gate is uh, closed and locked more than it is open, okay? And I can understand uh, the public safety issue of kids possibly being uh, in there after dark. You know, I understand that, but I, when I drive by, by there during the day, a lot of times that gate is closed. Uh, so, um, you know, as far as maintaining uh, the park, I think uh, we need more uh, more uh, uh, play areas for little kids in the park, uh, possibly a, um, a new basketball court for Tukas, and um, Hillstrom also has uh, room for a, for a basketball court. So um, that would be my plan for, for both of them. Yes, the mic. So I think there are many things that we need to do to improve the parks in our ward. Um, starting with Hillstrom, I think that there is an issue with parking. There's a lot of land over there. Um, I know there are a lot of people interested in playing large field games there. The parking isn't so great to fit all the cars, so I'd want to look at that. Um, I also think that um, Tukas Park 
as John said, hasn't been touched for a very long while. I think we need to improve the play areas for little kids in that space. Um, and look at both of those parks. I know they have a lot of water, um, a lot of wetlands, which makes it kind of difficult to build specific kinds of sports fields on those wet parts. Um, but I wonder, Oh. Yeah. But I wonder if maybe we can look and see if we could use some of those spaces as a dog park or at least a small dog park. Um, I also think there are some access problems to parks in our area. So McKinley Park, for example, between Hoveden and Winter Street, I think there is um, a lot of difficulty to cross that street, especially once we get more little kids playing on the new Patriots play set that's going to be there soon. Um, we're going to have to look at public safety um, with blinking lights or speed bumps. Um, so I think, and how are we going to pay all this? Well, I think we have to work a lot more with the private sector um, and with foundations to bring in more um, money for those play spaces. And I also believe that um, we can find some money from the city funds as well um, and work with our state reps to bring some state money to Brockton. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, whoever asked the question, thank you. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need uh, a lot more attention devoted to uh, the public parks in Ward 6. A lot, of, uh, a lot of parks closer to downtown or in other areas get more attention sort of because of where they're located and you can, you know, it's easier and, you know, people find it more beneficial to, to focus on it. Uh, but Ward 6 is 95% single family homes. And there's a bunch of families there who would love to use a park in their own backyard. Tukas Park desperately needs more attention, and Hillstrom Park really is just very run down. The basketball courts there are in terrible shape. Uh, the baseball field is, you know, it's, it's a mess. There's really no parking whatsoever, even when the gates open. Um, we need to devote a lot more attention to that park and Tukas. Uh, and I'm currently looking at the uh, a resident at the edge of to, uh, at the edge of Hillstrom is interested in selling some property that borders the park. If the city can acquire that property, uh, there used to be a pond there, which uh, you know longtime residents of the area may remember. There used to be a pond, and you know kids would go skating and things like that. If we're able to acquire that property and sort of reclaim the pond. Uh, it will, you know, really help motivate a lot more attention to Hillstrom, and it will really, uh, you know, start the ball rolling in terms of effort and attention paid to it. Not only that, it, it makes the park a, uh, not just a sports destination. You're not there for an hour and then you leave. You might go there to relax, walk your dog any time in the day. You know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but we're headed towards it. I think what I'll do going forward is stand up if we're close to time. I didn't realize in the rules there were one minute to answer a question and then 30 second reply. So we'll go for that forward. Everybody got about the same amount of time with this last one. So question number two, and I will pass the mic back and we'll start with Jack for that one. Do you welcome a big apartment building on the site of the old factory on Spark Street? Right. I think we have a similar question on Friday, right? Uh, oh, the, uh, a big apartment building on Spark Street. Uh, I'm going to have to say no. I've actually spoken with the uh, Director of Planning and Economic Development, Rob May, about this before. Uh, the area's infrastructure, the area you know, itself would not be able to handle the amount of cars and the amount of traffic that that building would put out. Uh, and you know, it's, it's more likely that whoever's, in, whoever's going to be developing that, you know, pulls up stakes and skips town when they find out how much money it's going to cost to clean that property out. Uh, large apartment buildings, things like that, are not something you see as often in this ward. You know, we, we as I said earlier, we're a very uh, neighborhood-centric ward, a lot of, you know, quiet areas. Um, an apartment <coughs> building, especially in that area, the noise, the traffic, and everything that comes with it would have its problems. I'd rather see it stay uh, uh, industrial. Okay, Joanne next. 
I have to agree with Jack on that to a certain extent. Um, I don't think that's the best place for a large apartment building. I think there are a few issues there. The first one is, of course, traffic. Um, I also think that the city needs to begin to look at the balance that it has between its residential taxes and its commercial taxes. Um, large apartment buildings bring in families who have a lot of children. Um, and those children go to our schools and we need to be able to afford to give them the kind of education that they all deserve. So I think that what I would really love to see in the Montello area more generally is commercial development, um, particularly small businesses. There is space, unlike in downtown, there is space in Montello for um, restaurants that have outdoor seating spaces or bars, for example, that have outdoor seating spaces. I'd like to see those kinds of activities in Montello, specifically also because I think we really do need to get our commercial revenue up in the city if we're going to do the kinds of things that we all want to have done. So the, um, the big factory building that the, um, the question is referring to is actually literally at the end of my street. It's the, Bro the old Brock and Solon Plastics factory building for anyone that's not fam familiar with it. Um, I don't know if anyone from the city has approached the owner. This is a privately owned um, building. Uh, some small businesses there. I don't know if anyone has approached the, uh, uh, anyone from the city has approached the owner about selling. but. Um, I'm also not in favor of only an apartment complex there, but uh, maybe uh, making it multi-use, maybe making it residential, commercial, retail, okay? Now, I understand um, that that would take rezoning uh, the area, but that uh, we have a train station right there, right around the corner, and we're not making full use of the train station. People are coming in, parking at the train station, and then leaving. I mean, we should use that train station as a focal point for, um, for development. Thank you all. Um, the next question, let me stop the timer here and reset. The next question I'm going to kind of rework a little bit, but the first part of the question is, um, if you are elected, would you be willing to launch an investigation regarding the revenues derived from the motel hotel tax? This money was intended for inf infrastructure improvements. Uh, the person that wrote this says, it's my understanding that this money is being funneled through the 21st Century Corp to keep the Rocks and Shaw Center afloat. There is more to the question, but I think it's more opinion, so I'm not gonna say it. Um, and I will start this one with Joanne. Thanks. I think we can do a lot more in the city to improve transparency, um, and that's a big thing for me. I was looking at some of the city budgets from cities in and around Massachusetts, Cambridge, for example. Um, everything is presented online to the public in very fine detail, so you can see exactly where the money's coming in, pretty much line item by line item. Um, you also see a list of objectives for the city council for that year. Um, so transparency is a big thing for me. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Can you can you repeat what it was called? Um, it's the hotel motel tax. Hotel motel tax. So the I don't I'm extra not... percent from the six point two five right. percent. Right. So I don't know the history of that. Um, but if it is the case that it was supposed to be allocated in a certain way and it's not, then that's definitely a question that I'll be asking and we'll want to find out more about. Okay. Pass it to Jack. Jack. Thank you. I'm a very big supporter of infrastructure. If I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many people here are from Ward 6, but our roads, the vast majority of them are long overdue to be repaved. Uh, currently I sit on the accounts committee. We review expenses and things like that and we work with the auditor to, uh, you know, try and make the city as financially accountable uh, as possible. But you know, and aside here, how many people here have tried to find something on the city website? Was it very easy? No, it's, we, we need to do a lot, not only with transparency, but with accessibility. You know, if you say, oh, it's there, you know, you just have to look for it. Well, that's not right. We're supposed to be providing you with all this information. Uh, so we need to, you know, we need to make sure this information is out there and accessible. And we need to make sure you know where your money is going. Okay, and pass to John, please. I'm going to be very brief with the answer here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in transparency and honesty in city government. 
um, huge believer. And uh, if uh, money that's allocated for a certain purpose is going somewhere else, okay, uh, I'm going to call the people on that. I don't care if it's the mayor. Um, you know, uh, the m money that's allocated for something, it's like a grant. Okay, if you write a grant and get approved for a grant for a specific person, a purpose, it has to go for that purpose. So, um, you know, I think it's outrageous that uh, if, if, if it's true that this hotel motel tax is going to other, pur uh, other purposes or other reasons, um, I'm definitely going to do something about that. Thank you all. The next question says Council Lally on it, but I think it can go to all three candidates. So this says, um, please explain your position on the proposed affordable housing development on Thatcher Street at St. Joseph's Manor in Ward 4. Also address impact on schools, city budget, etc. I'm going to start back here and we'll pass it down because that could be answered by all three candidates. So this is an interesting question for me because I have a very close relationship with the Sisters of Jesus Crucified uh, who own the convent that uh, abuts this land. And of course the Sisters um, uh, are, are in favor of selling the land. Um, I personally do not think it's a good idea to make it all residential or um, low income um, housing. Uh, when you invite young families in, you're also um, uh, the potential for uh, for children coming in to the um, to the city is also there, and the school system is already overburdened and understaffed. So um, I've, I've looked at I've looked at the uh, the plans for this development. Uh, I'm opposed to it. Okay, I will continue to be opposed to, uh, opposed to it. The uh, the buildings are, are too close. I've seen the layout. Um, there, there's, there's, there's very, very little frontage, there's very little backyards, so, um, you know, is, uh, the, the sisters do want to sell the land, but I think, um, you know, having strictly residential is, is the wrong thing to do with it. Okay. Joy? So I've already touched on this um, in my previous answer. I think that the city has a really big problem with balancing residential uh, revenue and commercial revenue. Um, I think we need to begin to balance that out before we start considering bringing in more apartment buildings, more single housing family homes, more anything. Because at the moment, as we all know, there are cuts to our school system and we want to be able to give more money to the kids that we've currently got so that they can get the best education. And if we bring in more kids and more people without having the offset of the businesses to help balance that revenue, I just don't think it makes business sense for the city and I worry about our long-term stability. All right, so first of all, we do absolutely need more businesses in this city. You know, we need more investment, we need more attention paid to, you know, that side, uh, you know, that side of the equation. I did vote for this. It is, um, you know, for what it is, it is not just low income housing. This is workforce housing. You have to be gainfully employed. You're not, this is not somewhere where you're just going to stick people. These people are working to improve their lives. They're working to get better and contribute to this community. Not only that, the developers are giving the city money, money that can help schools, parks, infrastructure. This is not some black hole that's just going to take. And, you know, if it were down, if it were in between this residential project and a company that wanted to build there or a business that wanted to grow, I would absolutely go with the business. But we need to, we need to do something to attract these people first and a larger, more capable workforce is what this city needs. Okay. The next question is kind of interesting. I'm not gonna change it. It says, do you endorse any mayoral candidates? I'm gonna start with Joanne. No, I don't. Um, I think it is important to give everybody a fair shot. I will be looking at the debates and in the interviews and making my decision, as I'm sure all of you are, to see who I think is the best candidate, but I'm not going to endorse anybody. No, that's not my role and I don't think it's appropriate. Jack. Jack. I tell people this at the door all the time. 
my job is to be your representative. And in order to do that, I have to have as good a relationship as possible with whoever the mayor is. I do not get involved with other school committee races, with other council races, with other mayoral races. You know, I try and refrain from, you know, from, uh, from getting involved in, you know, in races where I will have to work with the winner. You know, it's all well and good if the person I like wins, but if not, it's, it's not a productive relationship. Um, we're, you know, we're behind the ball on, on quite a few things. It's, it's really essential that we do what is best for this ward, um, you know, not what's best for somebody's personal career. Thank you. So endorsements look good on, on a candidate's resume, but it doesn't win elections. And uh, I'm, I'm of the mind of my two opponents here that, no, I, I'm not planning on endorsing anyone. I have a pretty good idea who I'm going to vote for, um, unless something changes drastically, okay? But that's my own personal decision. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I agree with Jack, I don't think it's my place to endorse somebody that's running for another office. So that would be my answer. Thank you all. Now this question starts with a question and ends with a, um, a long um, explanation. But I'm going to read it. I think it's interesting. What will you do to get us out of the desal debacle? It says, so far Brockton has dumped over 60 million. Our illustrious leaders keep telling us that we are in an ironclad contract. Aquaria has breached the contract on several occasions. The council had MWRA option two years ago. Any second year law student can clearly see this is nothing but a money maker for a select few. The 78 million turns into over 100 million with interest. Now this is the author's comments. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. John first. So first of all, I don't have $78 million in my bank account, so I personally can't do anything about it. <laughs> but um, uh, to, to try to answer the question, I think uh, before, we, before we buy a desal plant, for $78 million, we need to explore all options. And I know the council has explored, uh, one option they have explored was uh, hooking into uh, Stoughton's um, water, water system, and that wasn't economically feasible. But I don't think we've explored all options. Uh, at the current time, I'm opposed to buying the plant. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea right now. Um, we should, again, uh, explore all our options. Uh, we are in an ironclad uh, contract, but Aquaria, uh, Aquaria's track record hasn't been too good. Uh, for those of you that remember two or three years ago, uh, Council, uh, uh, Councilor at Large, now Council President Bob Sullivan was asking for marketing information from Aquaria and it took him, uh, it took months before they presented anything to the Council and then it was a 100-page uh, booklet that was very difficult to read. So, I, quite honestly, I don't trust them. Uh, I, I think this is, a, uh, this is a, uh, a, a desperation move on their part. Okay, a minute 20 to answer. Is it me or Jack? You. Me. So, I've worked in the water sector for over 10 years now, and there are lots of things that we need to be considering here and my concern is that nobody's really thinking about the long-term security of water supply here in Brockton. There's a lot of focus on the Aquaria plant. There is a lot of people saying that if we buy the plant we can sell the water to other communities. I have yet to see any evidence that there's any other community that's actually interested in buying that water. Aquaria hasn't been able to sell that water today, which is one of the arguments how it's in breach of its contract. Um, and I doubt that they're going to be able to because desal water is very expensive and communities will turn to alternative options before they turn to the most expensive option. I do feel like we have to look at specific scenarios under MWRA to see what is the most economically beneficial to Brockton in the long term. If we hook up with a community like Weymouth, for example, which is halfway to Braintree, where the major hookup point for us would be, then I believe that the cost benefit could potentially um, rival that of the Aquaria plant. There are a lot of questions about the um, actual functionality of the Aquaria um, plant and I haven't seen 
the latest from the mayor or his office in terms of what will be fixed. So for example, there's no backup energy generation. Um, if the power goes out, the desal plant shuts down. Apparently that's something that the contractors are willing to put in before we purchase the plant, but I'd like to see that in writing and I'd like the details of that. Okay. All right. Well, the city of Brockton got rights, legal ownership of Silver Lake in 1899. Uh, and it's lasted us, you know, at least this long. If that was not a good long-term uh, purchase, I do not know what was. We absolutely need to continue to look f uh, toward the future. Whatever we, whatever we decide to go with, MWRA or Aquaria, we will be relying on well into the future. Uh, Aquaria has not really been cooperative. Aquaria is very expensive. Uh, and you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions surrounding it. The MWRA, if we were to sign a deal with them, we would not be, we would not be approaching the negotiating table with any actual buying capability until 12 years from now. So whatever prices you see, whatever you see worked out with, uh, with Aquaria, you've got you've to factor in how much more it's going to cost 12 years from now. We could, you know, we could with the MWRA, another thing that looks promising with it, is we could work with Weymouth and Holbrook to run the pipe right through, and the pipe would be coming through Ward 6 first, so we would get our water first and our water pressure would improve. Um, both of these things require a lot, a lot more study, uh, but if we can get the Aquaria plant for, for cheaper, notably cheaper, uh, I think owning our own utility does have its own benefits. Okay. Next question is a very good question for everybody. Based on your ex background and experiences, what are your innovative ideas and solutions to the future of the ward and the city? Let's start with Joanne. For the past four years, um, up until sort of late last year, um, I have been a member of a co-working space in Boston called the Impact Hub. And the Impact Hub is a place where social and environmental entrepreneurs gather together to collaborate on small business ideas, um, to work together on freelance consulting projects, um, to do pro bono and free work for nonprofits and other organizations across the city and across the state. Um, I believe that we are perfectly positioned here in Brockton to bring an entrepreneurial community here. We have a lot of young people. For example, a couple years ago, I read about a woman who, a young woman from Brockton High who was in a junior fashion show on television, reality show with a supermodel. Um, and she, she, you know, she made it through a few rounds. She was fantastic. She was super talented. Um, where did she go? I don't know. Did she leave Brockton? I'm not sure. But there are a lot of young people here with a lot of creative business ideas, with a lot of artistic talents, and I feel like we could be bringing those into the community to help attract other businesses as well. Um, and then, of course, young people often have disposable income, so that supports residences and bars um, and other um, recreational places. Um, so I think we need to tap into, into that side of things for sure as one main thing. So being a um, lifelong resident of um, Ward 6 and a longtime homeowner there, uh, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, really. Uh, so um, one thing I would do would be uh, the, the, the city officials have to think out of the box. And by that I mean, I go back to my, the example of the old Brockton Solar Plastics building. Uh, we, have, we have a train station in Ward 6. Okay, and that should be the, the hub of Ward 6 and not just the parking lot. We can build around that train station. There's a lot of open lots and open land there. Um, perhaps the city has checked into that. I don't know, but uh, if they haven't, they should. Um, that, that owner may be ready to sell that factory. It's a huge lot. There's a huge lot abutting the factory. And um, uh, we, we have to look at more multi-use um, um, buildings, okay? Not just residential, okay? Uh, residential, commercial retail and that way it would attract businesses and also affect the, uh, the tax base in a positive way. Okay, and Jack. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
The uh, planning department has a plan right now, downtown Brockton revitalization, which also has, you know, later on stages in Campello, Montello, and all over the place. Uh, that do focus on, you know, bringing, bringing young people into the city, you know, making it a uh, more walkable environment, uh, you know, stores and shops on the ground floor and apartments up top, all centered around the train stations so they can, you know, we can have people coming to us and, you know, people heading out to Boston. Um, personally, I'm excited about things like public-private partnerships, working with companies and groups like that in order to get things that, uh, you know, get things that the city needs done. We've seen uh, throughout the country, you know, roads, highways, parks, things like that redeveloped and revitalized thanks to partnerships like that. Uh, you know, a couple of, you know, couple of uh, particulars, I'm really trying to, you know, focus on uh, working with Wentworth Institute of Technology to uh, bring in surveyors to make more uh, private ways public. And Denver, Colorado has an interesting idea in order to accelerate traffic, uh, you know, truck traffic and heavy vehicle traffic uh, down truck routes, you know, to encourage people to stay on the routes and to, uh, you know, head into Brockton more. Okay. Keep, keep the mic. Okay. okay. I'm just going to speak up in my loud voice. I hope you can hear. I have this on the cameras, but not for I'll, you. I'll relay it. Okay. Um, I want a yes or no. I don't want any explanation. Yes or no to purchase the desal plan. You're going to take a vote on it as a city councilor. Yes or no. Jack first. As is, unless something changes, unless they, oh, sorry, yes or no. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Joanne? No. John? Definitely no. Okay, that was easy. Yep. The next question is, do you support the rezoning of 166 East Ashland Street to build condos? Why or why not? I'm gonna start with John. Again, this goes back to the argument of, um, you know, if you build more housing, whether it's low income, uh, middle income, or high income, um, you're, and you're inviting more families into into a city that's um, strapped for businesses, uh, you're adding strength to the school system, okay? Especially with the young families that may have young kids in the school system. And the school system right now is, as everyone knows, is is under the gun, okay? They, 80, they opened school this year with 84 teachers short. That's outrageous, okay? So, um, you know, that increases uh, the classroom size and it decreases the chance of maybe a special needs student or somebody that, uh, you know, a kid that needs some extra help, uh, possibly, um, possibly getting that help because the, uh, the ideal class size should be about 23, 25. Uh, there's a lot of classes that open the, the year with uh, over 30 students. So, um, that, that, that I, I, I'm actually opposed to, to building more residences in that area. So my understanding is that um, 166 East Ashland, which for those of you who might not know where that is, if you're um, in the Save-A-Lot Plaza on Cary Hill, it's kind of across the little brook that's over there, next to National Grid, but behind the houses. Um, so that plot of land, uh, we got a lot of state money um, back in the day to clean it up. It was a very polluted site. Um, and now my understanding is that that area is zoned as a sports complex, uh, or for sports, has been purchased, um, and now they're trying to rezone it for industrial condos, which I think in um, my understanding, again, is that that means storage units. Um, so if, if, if I'm right, and I'm pretty sure I am because I've been to the meetings, um, I do not think that's a great place to put storage units. We don't need more storage units in Brockton. Um, they bring, occasionally they bring illegal activity. Um, they don't bring much revenue to the city. Um, and they're usually an eyesore. Um, and there's tons of them in the city that are half, half empty. So why do we need any more of those? That would be a perfect place to expand Tukas Park, put in more parking spaces. That would be an excellent place to, um, or an excellent opportunity to talk to National Grid, see if they might want to sponsor purchasing that land and turning it into an extension of the park. I think there's a lot of more creative and beneficial things we can do with that land for the city. 
Right. Currently, the, uh, the proposal is for industrial condos, uh, which are basically contractor bays. You know, that's somewhere where a plumber might park his trucks and keep all his, uh, you know, spare equipment and things like that. Um, right now, the, the residents nearby do have their questions and their concerns, and there is some concern over, uh, you know, how how the how the how the project came to be. There's some there's some question about, uh, you know, originally the property was sold at auction, um, but and I'm I'm looking for State Rep Dubois, but she's uh, she's not here anymore. She you know she's uh, been at the meetings uh, with me when we talked about this. Um, there's, you know, there was some question about, uh, you know, the legality of the purchase. They, you know, originally it was an auction. You, you're bidding and you're buying what you, you know, what you just bid on. Uh, but the winning bidder, you know, made it uh, a stipulation that the property be rezoned or they weren't buying it. And there was uh, a lot of confusion about how that could happen. And, you know, it really is not illegal. So we, you know... If it's if it's illegal, then the answer is very simple. You know that's not acceptable. You can't have an illegal business operator. Okay, now I have individual questions that are addressed to individual people, but I think some of them apply to everybody. So let's try this first one. Mm -hmm. The first one was asked of Joanne. I picked one for each one of you. Does Joanne have a full time job, and what is it? Yes, I do. So I work full time as an operations director for a national nonprofit called Green Camps, which means I manage everything from fundraising through to their finances and budgets. Um, on the side, at the moment, I also work as a consultant in sustainable water management. That is something that I would stop doing if I was to be elected. Okay, John. Good. Yes. Same, same question? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I've been retired now for about um, four years, three and a half, four years. Uh, my working background, uh, my entire working life practically was as a uh, retail store manager. Uh, last uh, company I worked for was Grossman's Bargain Outlet here in Brockton. I also worked in the Boston stores. Uh, being a retail store manager, you have to be familiar with uh, the human resources part of the business and also budgets. So I'm very familiar with budgets. Um, you know, uh, to watching the bottom line and that type of thing. Um, so, uh, back to the question, uh, am I working now? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm retired. And uh, that gives me a distinct advantage over my two opponents. Uh, Jack's a full-time college student. Joanne works full-time. So, um, I, can, uh, I, I can put my effort into this. Okay, pass down to Chad. Right. I do have a full-time job. I, I guess you could say I have two full-time gigs. You know, I am a student. I'm off of Bridgewater State's campus, you know, around noontime every day. I do all my classes in the morning, all my schoolwork I can take care of. You know, once the time, you know, once I, once, once the time, I'm able to get it done. Um, am I on a full-time job? City counseling. I treat this as a full-time job. I do not, you know, you don't clock out after a couple hours and say, oh, well, that's all for today. We can come back tomorrow. You work until you get a resolution. You solve the problem. You, you can't do this job, um, you know, if you're, if you're working on a clock. I treat, I treat this job like a full-time job. You have to give it the respect it deserves. And, you know, to this day, short of, uh, you know, attending uh, a, a breakfast or a dinner or something like that, which is not essential to the job, uh, I have not had to miss a single thing for Bridgewater State University. And if it comes time where I have to represent residents or go to somewhere on campus, I'm going to represent residents. I chose to do this job, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. The okay, next question originally was addressed to John, but again, I think it can be addressed to everybody. It said, as a full-time representative of Ward 6, if elected, would you try to take credit for other people's ideas? Example, 
problems on Sully Road and school area, also about the proposed sports complex on Howard Street, Route 37. So since it was originally addressed to John, I'll start with John. Well, I would, I, I would never try to take uh, credit away from uh, another counselor or another city official that has, has uh, successfully uh, taken care of problems. Uh, that's not my style and never has been. Um, you know, uh, running for office, I, I, when you look at my palm card, my campaign literature, uh, everything there is true, okay? Every, everything's, you know, I don't exaggerate anything. Um, you know, some, some candidates uh, take credit for everything. It's like almost like the second coming of Christ. You know, they, 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 they solve all of the world's problems, but uh, that's not me, that's not my style, it never will be. Thank you. Joy? No, I would never do that. Um, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that I have a long history professionally of collaborating with others to do projects. I've authored, for example, multiple research publications related to water sustainability always giving credit where credit's due. I would continue to do that. Um, it's just black and white to me. Of course, I would never claim somebody else's work as my own or even their idea as my own, never. No, I would not take credit for other people's work. That's not what you're supposed to do. Um, you know what? This job requires honesty, requires you to give everyone all the information you have and, you know, if you do your job, if you answer the phone, if you continue doing what you're supposed to do, you'll have enough of your own work to take credit for. You don't need to take somebody else's. The examples, uh, I thought were kind of weird. The, the, uh, the sports complex, the entire history of the sports complex, the land was rezoned by Michelle Dubois when she was city councilor. I took office. I submitted the legislation to put that property out to bid. I sat on the committee to determine the winning bid, and I'm working with the developer to make sure that you know this is up and operating and contributing to the community. Uh, the property on Sully Road. I was approached by that. You know, I was approached by concerned residents early on as counselor. Uh, I got the ball rolling on that. And, you know, later on, the constituents also reached out to Councillor Farwell, who, you know, is very big into code enforcement, and we've both worked on this item. This is not, uh, you know, I, I don't understand why those items were brought up. Okay, I'm going to do follow-up on this one. I saw John shaking his head. Do you want to address the... I do. Quickly. I 30 do. seconds, yes. okay? I want to address the Sully Road situation. Okay, for people that aren't familiar with that, okay, there's, there was an uh, illegal asphalt operation uh, in, in a residence. And um, I, I walked, during my uh, neighborhood canvassing, uh, going door to door, I talked to the neighbors on Sully Road and uh, the, the area surrounding Sully Road. Uh, those neighbors, okay, and it wasn't uh, Jack, it wasn't uh, one call, okay, uh, those neighbors claimed uh, several calls to you and um, uh, about that situation and then finally uh, Councilor Lodge went for and got it resolved. Okay, pass it to Jack and then Joanne and go 45 seconds. From when I first campaigned for office in 2015, people brought this issue to my attention, all right? When I took office, I worked with code enforcement in the building department. I worked with the inspectors in the Board of Health. I worked with the law department. This is not an instant open and shut thing. It's very clear they were illegally operating a business out of their property, but even then, they need the burden of proof. They need to assemble a lot of evidence. This was started a long time ago. Uh, it should have been started before I took office. As far as I can tell, you know, the, the ball was either re, you know, I either reignited it or got the ball rolling. But I'm, I'm concerned, you know, with the, with the way this is written off as, as uh, inaction on my part. Joanne? I don't have anything to say on that. Okay. 
the next question was similar to that, so it all kind of blends together. Let me see if I can find something different um, at this point. Um, they all get to look alike at one point. Um, we talked about Ames and Spark already, so I think we're good with that. We Thatcher Street we talked about. Playgrounds and fields we talked about, but this is a little different, so let's go for this one. Um, and I'll start with Jack. I'll pass the mic back down to him. Um, are you going to try to update the playgrounds and fields behind the following schools, Brookfield and Ashfield? Simple answer, absolutely. Uh, going back to the sports complex, their community give back is they will be re, you know, redoing all of the fields behind the Brookfield Elementary School. All of those baseball fields will be reseeded, new snack shack, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we're looking at lights, new dugouts, everything. They're going to be completely redone. Uh, as far as the Ashfield, uh, Brophy Phillips, which is op you know, uh, constructing the uh, Woodland Park development off of North Quincy Street, originally promised to uh, provide a new playground for the Ashfield School. Take a look at that one on your way out. It's burnt in many places. Uh, they promised that 16 years ago. I got them to pay up. The money they paid up, about nine grand, not, nowadays is not enough for a new playground. But the, it's been handed to the school department. The school committee will be doing what they can with it. And that's not, uh, you know, I'm not, white, I'm not washing my hands of this issue. The more money, the more uh, investment and grants we can get for the area, the better. Yes, of course. I think both schools definitely need playground improvements. Um, if I become counselor, I will definitely hold the sports complex developer um, accountable for the promises that he has made. If the sports complex doesn't come off um, and something else is built in that area, again, I will make sure that that, sports, um, that, that, that developer holds up his promises as he originally stated. Um, the Ashfield School as well, I think it's really important for a city councillor to work closely with their school committee member so that you can apply for grants to help build out the play fields and the playgrounds. So that could be from private businesses in the area, that could also be from state grants that are available um, or private foundations as well. Of course, I'm in, I'm in favor of improving both, uh, both locations. Uh, Brookfield School um, is in a good location and in a, in a good situation with the uh, sports complex coming in. But uh, again, like Joanne, I would hold the uh, developer uh, responsible for the uh, the promises he's made. Okay, uh, the uh, the uh, old removal park is going to be part of the sports complex, and uh, land the budding in the Brookfield School will be part of it. And he's made all kinds of promises to make all kinds of improvements, but it's easy to to talk to talk. You have to walk the walk also. So um, I would hold them responsible. Um, Ashfield here is sometimes uh, the, the poor step, stepchild. People forget the school is here. Uh, we need, um, that fire out there was, um, happened quite a while ago and nothing has been done. So we need to, uh, we need to improve the, uh, the facilities here also. Thank you. The next one is uh, pretty specific. I'm not sure what street it is, but it says, my street floods, when it rains or snows, children have to walk through all that water to go to school. There is also a house with a developmentally disabled man, and sometimes they go out for walks with their staff or alone when they are upset. I feel that this is not only a safety issue, but a health hazard as well. What will you do to fix this issue? Start with John. Well, as, as everyone knows, um, or oh, should know, a lot of the streets in both Brookfield and Ashfield uh, are what's called not recognized by the city. I'm not sure if this particular street is, but if it is not, it's the, the sitting councilor's job to get that process moving forward uh, and, and repair whatever repairs need to be done there. It sounds like uh, the street is flooding because uh, possibly of uh, potholes, uh, large potholes, 
or that type of thing. Um, maybe poor, poor drainage, okay? So that, that becomes the city's responsibility. Those people on whatever street that is are paying property taxes and they deserve and need the services the city provides. Is it, sorry, mine? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of residents having problems with drainage in their um, areas. So, for example, um, the corner of Ardsley Circle in Wellsford has a sewer that keeps overflowing when there's a storm. It turns Wellsford Street into a river. Um, there's also concerns around the um, Melrose Street area by Tukas Park where they have a constant uh, smell of sewage and they also have overflows and they've called the DPW and the DPW has come around, looked inside, poured some chemicals down, but the problem keeps repeating itself over and over again. So I think as a city councillor it is most definitely a responsibility to hold uh, city departments accountable for making the improvements that need to be made to prevent these kinds of drainage problems. It also comes back to infrastructure, um, especially in the area of um, Ward 6 where I live. Um, the Campanelli houses weren't built. Um, in the way that houses nowadays are, and so the pipes are very small, grease and fats build up, that's a big problem. So we need more money to put into the infrastructure in Ward 6 for sure. And again, that comes back to making sure that we as a city are financially healthy in order to be able to do so. Well, I, I agree. When uh, Campanelli built these properties, uh, there was you know, little regard for what was underneath the ground. Springs, things like that were completely ignored. Um, back in the, the good old days, and you see I, you know, I'm, I'm using the air quotes. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the people there, the, the, the politicians in office, um, you know, did not really look too far ahead. They were too eager to see development immediately in, uh, in front of them. Uh, so they let Campanelli get away with quite a bit. The roads have no base coat. He basically paved over the ground. The pipes underneath are too small. And most of these roads are still original pavement. They've never been touched. Uh, it's, it's, it's alarming. The state of Massachusetts came in uh, several years ago and they did a study. They reviewed every street in the city of Brockton. And, oh, another thing, before I forget, Campanelli skipped out on a lot of drainage, too, which creates a lot of these problems, you know, throughout the entire ward. Uh, I believe it's, I believe it's uh, Scott Road that actually has the, uh, the little holes in the middle of the sewer covers, little, uh, little uh, fountains, whenever, whenever it rains too heavily. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, the state of Massachusetts came in, they reviewed every single road in the city and they determined that in order to bring up every road just to what the state would consider adequate, not even good, adequate, would cost $1.2 billion. To put that in context, a third of that is what the city's budget is for everything yearly. Something's got to give. We need more money for infrastructure. We need you know, more redevelopment of the roads in this area, or we're all going to be in big trouble. This is a good one. I'll start with Jack. Please state something you admire about the other two candidates. I oh, had to start with that. No, okay. Um, well, certainly, I, I would have to say I respect and I admire the fact that we're all sitting here today. It is, uh, you know, it's very easy to, you know, to pick at and criticize people who run for office because you don't like them or you don't agree with them. But it takes a lot to get yourself out there. You've got to talk with a lot of people. You know, you've got to uh, really put yourself out there, your opinions and your ideas, uh, in, you know, just, just wanting to make the, uh, you know, the place you live a better place. So, you know, I, I really think that it's very commendable that you both, you know, put yourselves out there and decided to run for office. You know, it's something that, it's something that uh, really should be, you know, treated with respect, regardless of however you vote or whoever you support. Uh, you know, I tell this to my people all the time. You know, everyone, everyone if they're putting themselves out there, you've got to, uh, you've got to respect that. 
Um, I'll start with you, Jack. I really admire that you ran when you had just, you were basically just 18 and you started campaigning for office, and I think that's absolutely incredible. There are very few young people who will put themselves out there publicly for any cause, never mind for public office, so awesome. Um, and John, I really respect all the work that you do in the community. Um, I know that you're very actively involved in, in many things, whether it's church-related um, or community service-related, um, and I think that's one of your best qualities. Okay. Well, Jack, I, I, I agree with uh, I agree with you, uh, Joanne, on your uh, your assessment. Um, you know, not too many people. Uh, 18 years old can even tell you who the president of the United States is and you went out there in 2015 and uh, you know put yourself out there and uh, I admire that I admire that and um, you know I also admire the fact that you're uh, you're running for re-election okay um, you're uh, an old man now at 20 okay so. I feel it <laughs> So um, I, I certainly respect that, uh, Joanne. I um, I'm amazed at your educational background. Okay, I think one thing you didn't mention tonight was that you spent some time in London, England. So um, uh, you know your your education, your educational background is certainly uh, certainly more than uh, Jack and I combined. So I I, I admire that. Thank you, and I really like that question. We'll be using it in other debates. Um, last one, because the others are all very similar, and we are close to, we have four minutes left, okay? So this one is going to be really quick to the point in terms of the minute, so I will stand up immediately. It's kind of a long question, but let's try it. Would it not be more advantageous for Brockton to add more businesses rather than condos to cost us less expenses like more schools and therefore less taxes, also more jobs, and the rest of the question says less welfare. So I'm going to start with John. Well, definitely. I'm, I'm in favor of um, more for-profit businesses coming into the city. We have a lot of nonprofits that do not pay anything in taxes right now. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm in favor of family-friendly for-profit businesses coming in. Uh, the sports complex is what I call a family-friendly business. A power plant is not a friendly, a family-friendly business. Um, so I'm in, I'm in, I'm in favor of, um, of family-friendly for-profit businesses that would uh, maybe help our tax base. Um. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit before this evening. Um, I think that, like when you, you know, when I'm at work and I sit down and I do a budget for the next year, I have to look and see where our money comes from. So we're getting this much money from conference fees. We get this much money from advertising fees, um, and so on and so forth. And I think what we really need to do in the city is look and see not just where our money's coming from, and it's mostly coming from residential property taxes, it's not coming from a commercial base, um, and we also need to look at what our actual costs are. So we're pretty confident that we know how much it costs to educate a child, I've seen the figures from the superintendent, but we're not so confident when it comes to other things, like how much does it cost to supply a gallon of water to a household. We need both of those bits of information and then make proper financial decisions. More businesses? Absolutely. Brockton has had uh, more than its fair share of, uh, you know, nonprofits and state offices and things like that that really don't get us any further. Uh, you know, if anything, they're taking properties off the tax rolls, and that's not something we need. That's not something we can afford. Um, you know, to, to all of that question, we, we absolutely need more business. We need more investment in this community. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's as simple as that. Thank you. We cut it back slightly because we have a minute 38. So I want to thank the residents of Ward 6 for submitting the questions. A couple of residents out of Ward 6. I did my best to uh, sift through them and not have any gotcha questions for any of the three candidates. I think you're all a credit to running for office and serving in office. I've done it myself, and it takes a lot to take away time from your family and your friends to be on the ballot. So the most important thing is on September 19th, please go out and vote. Do not 
sit home and have 4% like we did one year. Elections, people fought and died for them. Veterans, for sure. So let's get out and show Brockton we got what it takes. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs>